Welcome everybody to another session in our Women Lead Online Forums brought to you by Connected Women of Influence. In fact, this is the first one of 2020. So yay, you know, congratulations, you're joining in on the very first one. I'm Patty Vargas, I'm your host today, and today we have a subject matter expert in the hot seat who is willing to say, yeah, go ahead, ask me anything. And our session today lasts for about an hour. If you've joined with video, you'll be able to see our guests and the attendees alike. Questions and comments are always welcome. And if you have something you'd like to ask anonymously, just put it in the chat to me and I will share it for you. Our topic today is the business of you. Pap smears, mammograms, hot flashes, oh my. This is my life that we're talking about here. <laughs> and I am so excited to introduce today's subject matter expert. Let me tell you a little bit some uh, a little bit about her. So Cheryl Gidry is a dedicated women's health nurse practitioner with 35 years of diverse nursing experience and 22 of those years have focused on uh, OBGYN nursing. She's a compassionate supporter of reproductive health care and comprehensive sex education and STD prevention. Cheryl's also a relationship coach for single women over 50. Her passion is women's health and educating single women over 50 how to develop healthy, committed relationships. Her professional speaking topics include safe dating for women over 50 and searching for your truth. So without further ado, let me introduce you and turn this over to my good friend, Cheryl Gidry. Hi, good afternoon. So happy to be here. And this is my, my, uh, one of my greatest topics to talk about women in wellness, especially when you're a business woman, because you know, when you're busy, we have a tendency to put our health on the back burner, mm -hmm. you know, especially, uh, in this, in the age grade, uh, age of 40 plus, mm -hmm. uh, we tend to uh, think we don't have to do as many uh, health related things. And, and we really do need to keep up with uh, our pap smears, our mammograms, and talk about menopause uh, and those symptoms that come along as we uh, get to midlife. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I had a woman share with me recently that she has never had a mammogram and she's in her fifties. And uh, I said, well, now would be a really good time for you to go and get a baseline. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, but, you know, she, she's just very, very busy. And, yeah. and we don't, you know, what, what I, as you just said, what I find is as busy women, professional women, women who might be running their own business or uh, running their own company or, or running a department or a team or something like that. Um, we just, we put ourselves on the back burner and we mm -hmm. just don't make the time for that. Mm -hmm. As long as we're feeling good, we keep it moving. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And when you're feeling bad, is it the wrong time to find out something? Exactly. Because it's usually whatever it is, is far advanced. Yeah. Especially yeah. when it comes to any, um, breast conditions or uh, with pap smears mm -hmm. too. Um, so uh, I'd like to just start by talking about some of the new pap smear guidelines, yeah. if that's okay. Yeah. Um, I have women ask me all the time, why do the pap smear guidelines keep changing? We used to go every year, then we went to every three years, and now they're telling me every five years, mm -hmm. and what's going on with that? Mm -hmm. And so what's happening is, um, with pap smears, the virus that causes cervical cancer is called the human papillomavirus. Mm -hmm. And it has uh, over a hundred strains that they have come up with recently. And so not all of the strains cause cervical cancer. Mm -hmm. And so what they're doing is they're uh, trying to target those women that will be at the highest risk for getting cervical cancer and not overly testing women that are at a lower risk. And that's your women that are under 30. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so now um, the, the guidelines are for us to have a pap smear when you're over 30 uh, every five years. And that's only if you have had normal pap smears. Okay, if you've had any abnormal pap smears, then you should be seeing your provider more often. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. And I usually uh, recommend having what we call a well woman exam at least every year. Uh, a well woman exam includes a breast exam, you know, looking inside vaginally, talking to you about your risk factors for, you know, family history for breast cancer, uh, uh, any new sexual partners, uh, looking at your weight, see if you have any other chronic illnesses that uh, they need to, you know, look into further. So if you're doing that every year, then your pap smears will come into play, you know, as they're, uh, as they're needed. Mm -hmm. But if you stay away from the gynecologist for five years, a lot of things can come up in five years. Right. And so I usually recommend at least seeing a provider every year. Mm -hmm. Now, some of your primary care physicians will do well woman exams. And so uh, women will ask, well, do I need to see both? Well, if you're seeing your primary care and they're gonna do a breast exam and a vaginal exam, that's great. Mm -hmm. But a lot of primary care doctors do not do that. Right. They're, they're more focused on your health as far as diabetes, high blood pressure, checking those things out. You know, mm -hmm. because you know, heart disease also is a, a number one with women now. Yeah, and yeah. so, uh, Seeing someone at least once a year uh, is best as far as the pap smears. What's the, the magic about the age 30? Like before uh, you turn 30, you should have them more often and then after not as often. What, what happens at 30? Well, under 30, actually uh, women under 30 don't have what we have co-testing. There's two things that are done with a pap smear. We're checking for cervical cancer, Mm -hmm. And we're also checking for the human papillomavirus. Okay. So women under 30, we're not even checking them for the human papillomavirus until they are over 25. Okay. Because if we find it in that age group, uh, usually um, it, will, it has a chance of going away. Mm -hmm. uh, so we don't even add the, uh, the HPV to them till 25. Okay. They have usually, you know, more sexual partners mm -hmm. uh, in that age range. And so it's more important to follow them closer uh, when they're under 30. Mm -hmm. um, we, I was just explaining, having this conversation earlier that uh, now with women divorcing after long-term uh, marriages or being widowed, uh, we're getting married. Uh, more often. Uh, we're not staying in relationships that we're not happy in long term. Mm -hmm. And so we ha end up having more sexual partners. And the human papilloma is a sexually transmitted virus. It is not an STD, but it is transmitted through genital touching. Mm -hmm. And so if you're having new partners, you want to be up to date on your pap smears. Mm -hmm. What are the symptoms of that virus? HPV, you don't have any physical uh, symptoms unless you have some of the, long, the low grade strains of the HPV virus that causes like genital warts uh, and that type thing. Uh, the ones that are higher grade uh, will show up on your pap smears. And they have different levels of, uh, they have low grade HPV, high grade HPV. And so um, that's why it's so important not to miss any pap smears, especially if you've ever had an abnormal before. And if you know that you have, you know, changes in sexual partners too. So if it's not uh, an STD, you can't prevent it by, by using protection. Correct, because it can be transmitted through genital touching. It doesn't have to be intercourse. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's why we have pushed so hard for women under 26 to have the HPV vaccine, mm -hmm. uh, the Gardasil, to protect them. That's the only thing that we have right now to um, prevent cervical cancer. Wow. So we're pushing for you know all women 12 and 12 to 26 to have the vaccine, and mm -hmm. now uh, our boys can be vaccinated. I was so happy when they put the vaccine out for the guys because. A lot of times we get it from the guys, yeah. you know, and so if we protect both of them, you know, it prevents us from getting cerebral cancer. Well, this is really interesting. And now I understand the commercials. 
mm -hmm. you know, that, that you see on TV. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Yes. And, and the problem with that is a lot of people think that, um, a lot of parents, you know, think that if we give HPV vaccines to their children, teenagers, it's going to encourage them to be more sexually active. But a lot of times the parents don't know they are sexually active because they tell us <laughs> during their interview in the office, you know, when we, when we interview them, you know, and, um, you just want to protect your girls for later. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. And some women will ask, well, can I have the HPV vaccine if I'm over 26? Well, they haven't done the research for effectiveness over 26. So that's why it stops at 26. Okay. Oh. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Interesting. So um, other than, than HPV, is there something else that puts us at risk for cervical cancer? Uh, smoking, um, like I said, uh, multiple sexual partners um, are one of the main things that can put you at uh, risk for cervical cancer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's not something that's hereditary. You know, a lot of people say, well, my aunt had cervical cancer, so I need to be tested. No, your aunt and you don't have the same sexual history. Mm -hmm. So you won't have the same risk. Okay. Mm -hmm. wow. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Sure. Uh, so I was at, a, at an event recently and one of the vendors um, at the, uh, women's conference and one of the vendors had this new technology on um, for examining your breasts instead of a mammogram it's like an ultrasound type of machine mm -hmm. is that better or the same or different or is the the traditional machines are they still better than this what do you know anything about that well i do know that they are coming up with a lot of new 3d imaging mm -hmm. uh that they're using uh they're not widespread at all facilities yet because they are more expensive uh they also have some uh new technology where they, it's kind of like a, a MRI, but they inject a dye. Uh, and because of the increase in radiation, they're not, they have not pushed those forward yet. So I don't know if we'll see those come into play, but they'll definitely be doing more of the 3D, 4D mammogram testing. Now, as far as ultrasounds, ultrasounds uh, usually will help us if you have a nodule <clears throat> and we're trying to decide whether this is a cancerous nodule or if it's just benign mm -hmm. uh, because women have benign tumors in their breasts too you know if you're a high caffeine drinker mm -hmm. you'll have something that we call fibrocystic changes in your breasts more density in your breasts and when your your breasts are more dense it's harder for the mammogram to see through that dense tissue mm -hmm. and so uh, the ultrasound has its place too. I wouldn't say it's better or, you know, than the okay. other. Yeah. I think together they're good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Was it a was it something that they were selling to women to use themselves, or was it sort of educating yeah. you? No, it was. Um, they have their own facility. It's mm -hmm. um, their own business. They have the machines. They're doing it. It's it's not even something your insurance is going to take care of. It's mm -hmm. kind of like on your Cash. own. Mm -hmm. It's like the alternative to getting your breast smushed. <laughs> that's what the, yeah, and it sounded like okay, that's interesting. <laughs> I know, but so I went and had a smush anyway. <laughs> Someone's got to fix that. I swear, you know. <laughs> Came up. Cheryl, who came up with that? Do you, you know? know I had to, you know, I had to be a man. man. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that we should be designing the one to test for, you know, for their kinds of cancer. Yeah, <laughs> and it, it involves laying it down in a driveway and driving. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so. that's pretty much it though uh -huh. it is it is it's like you know I, I feel like saying here i'll leave my my boob with you and i'll be back tomorrow you know i know well, but i know <laughs> yeah i had uh i think it was last year uh my mammogram had a you know a, a abnormality and so i had to go in and i our insurance is with kaiser and they are 
um, they are on you about that. I mean, you're getting notices that you haven't had, you know, whatever test, you know, you need to have, whatever screening you need to have. And, and uh, so I had gone in, had the mammogram and, and they were immediately on me, like you need to come in and have a second screening and couldn't be done at the facility I go to, had, I had to go somewhere else. And, and that was horrible. I mean, it was, it was really painful. It was the, Trying to yeah, just... have dense tissue, and so trying to get it to a place where they could see it um, was, I mean, it, it was really, I have a high level of threshold for pain, and I, mm -hmm. I was crying, and then okay. I had to go have an ultrasound, because mm -hmm. they still couldn't tell, and mm -hmm. thank goodness the ultrasound mm -hmm. finally was the deciding factor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, the ultrasound helps to diagnose. Mm -hmm after the mammogram, anything that they see on the mammogram that cause them concern, yeah. they usually will either send you for what they call a comprehensive mammogram or a diagnostic that's a little bit more intense, yeah. and the, which is oh. probably what you had, mm -hmm. and then the, uh, the ultrasound too. Yeah, mm -hmm. they sent me, it was years ago, but that's, they sent me right in for a biopsy, like right away. Sometimes they Yes, and it was, it was just um, dense tissue, just, mm -hmm. I have, Cis, cis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, I think they were, if they couldn't get a better reading and the ultrasound, then that, the next thing was... Would have been a biopsy. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Very. not so funny, but kind of funny. <laughs> my, my husband had a lump um, a few months ago, and they said, you're going in and you're having a mammogram. And he went in and he came home and he was like that's terrible that hurts so bad and i was just like oh shut up <laughs> you'll never have to do this again <laughs> i don't even know how they they managed to get the male I, breast tissue in there but i know yeah but uh i, I imagine it probably was very painful for him <laughs> it, it, was, it was very painful yeah so, you know, since we're talking about um, mammograms, is there any new um, thinking about self-exams and... Um... Um, some of the new thinking uh, that they're saying now is, you know, we used to push a lot for women to have self-breast exams on their own. Mm -hmm. and, and they're pushing that they don't have to have them as much just to come in for their mammograms. But I, I don't believe in that. I push for a self-exam because most women that have breast cancer, it was something that they found at home. Yeah. You know, I felt this lump that was different than I felt before. And that's what brings them in. Yeah. You know, if you're, and they, they're even pushing mammograms sometimes to, uh, I know at Kaiser, up to two years, you know, one to two years. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, if something changes um, in between that time, you know, you, I feel you need to, to do your self breast exam. You know, we bathe every day, we put lotion on every day. So mm -hmm. check your breast. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, since you say lotions and all of that, what are, mm -hmm. what are the, what are the myths and the truths about deodorants and lotions and all of those things? The parabens, I'm sure, I'm sure that's been, you know, that's a concern, but like really what do we need to be watching out for? Good question. Uh, the, the parabens have been the main thing that they've been talking about. Uh, they're going to more, they're saying that you should have more um, of the de deodorants that are like the, the crystals, they have these new deodorants where it has no uh, scents in them, uh, no perfumes, that type thing. Uh, but I feel that research really hasn't gone that deep in it because they haven't really, in our guidelines, they haven't put anything for us to change, uh, to tell you all to change. Mm -hmm. So it's nothing that's written in stone. Mm. That's a good question because you mm -hmm. hear so much about that. Right. Yeah. I saw something on Facebook. It said, you know, when you're washing your face at night, wash mm -hmm. off you know, the deodorant. So I started right. making that a habit. Right. I do the I same. I don't know if it's making a difference. <laughs> I don't, I don't put it on after I bathe at night either. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, just because we don't, we never know what research, it, it goes back and forth. And so it's hard to say a hundred percent uh, what to share. So that's one of the things that I do, you know, and look at the yeah. baby powder. Look what happened with the baby powder mm. that women used to put the little puff puff and put baby powder all on the bottom. And now they're coming up with, you know, 
Mm -hmm. high risk for ovarian cancer, you know, it's like, oh my goodness, you know how many years women have put powder yeah. <laughs> in that area? Yeah. So um, we just, yeah. now we, when we know better, we just do better. But mm -hmm. so I just encourage women, you know, even with that, you know, don't use the baby powder in yeah. that area. Yeah. Um, and it's hard because some women uh, my age have been using it for years, you know, and their moms start them out with putting mm -hmm. baby, look, we put baby powder on our girls when they're babies, you yeah. know? Yeah. <laughs> so um, we just have to stay on top of, you know, the research yeah. and uh, go from there. But nothing's 100%. What about uh, breast implants? If you have implants, does a mammogram still work or? Uh, they, now, as far as the breast ex exams that we do in the office, I always tell ladies that, you know, I can't feel behind the implants. Mm -hmm. So they still have mammograms, you know, and a lot of them are very fearful that they're going to burst their, their, mam their, uh, implants. Yeah. Um, but they haven't, you know, as far as I've known the patients that I have that have had, that have had, uh, implants, mm -hmm. uh, they do ultrasounds too. Uh, so they can see, but we're limited as far as what we can see behind yeah. those implants. Wow. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> if if I had them, I think I would be worried when I was having a mammogram that they were gonna. Yeah, a lot of women do, and some some providers in private practice will allow them to have uh, an ultrasound, but they you know let them know that's not you know the best practice. Mm -hmm. uh, Cause someone will come in, I am not having one cause it's gonna hurt, it's gonna hurt my implants, it's gonna burst my implants, you know? And it's a, a big concern, you know, especially for women that have the, the larger ones, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, but they do do mammograms. I don't know how they, they do them uh, mm -hmm. physically, but they, they do do mammograms on women who have the implants. Wow. Yeah, Susie, that would be a good question for those, those um, that other vendor. Do they yeah. Do that yeah. Yeah. For sure. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, you know, let's uh let's let's talk about the M word. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> Menopause. Menopause. Yes. <laughs> you, see, you, see, you notice it has men oh pause. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what is that all about? <laughs> they they have their own version of I'm it. Not, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I told my husband he had menopause because he always has, he's always hot. I'm the one that's cold and he's always hot. I, and I, he went to his doctor, he says, my wife said, I have menopause. Is there a such thing? She says, no. I said, I don't care what your doctor says. You have menopause. <laughs> so yeah, menopause is something that uh, shows up um, in most women they'll start to transition in their 40s. Mm -hmm. um, with it uh, coming to a halt, usually between 50 and 55. I have had a few rare women that have gone to age 60. Mm -hmm. Usually if they go that far, we're looking for other problems. Yeah. But uh, most women are usually do, uh, done by no later than 55 years mm -hmm. old. And when the symptoms start, Everybody's different. Not every woman that goes through menopause and menopause is just a cessation of your periods. Yeah. Not every woman has uh, menopausal symptoms of mm -hmm. hot flashes, night sweats, irritability, vaginal dryness. Not everybody has that. Um, but the women that do, uh, some of them have more severe symptoms. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, what usually will start is the irregular cycles. Your cycles, you'll notice, will get either shorter and heavier, or they'll get they'll start to skip months. Mm -hmm. And you're not completely menopausal until you go at least 12 months with no bleeding, no spotting, no nothing. Hmm. And that's very important. And so when uh, when you begin to notice that your cycles are changing. It's really good to document in your calendar or on your phone when you have your cycles. Mm -hmm. And so that you'll know when that last period was, because that's what we look at. Okay. Uh, okay. If you tell me you haven't had a period in a year, I need to know the date. Mm -hmm. Because if it's been less than a year, or let's say it's been over a year, and you've had, you're having bleeding, we start looking for uterine cancer 
things like that. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's so important for us to know <laughs> if it has been a whole year. Uh, some women will have heavier, real heavy bleeding when it gets close to menopause, especially if they have a, a history of uh, fibroids. Uh, and fibroids are benign tumors that are uh, sometimes in the uterus. Uh, as they get close to menopause, some women will have a heavier pattern of bleeding. Mm -hmm. And they'll start coming in and wanting to know, oh, can I have a hysterectomy? Just take it all out, you know, take it all out. But if you can endure that, uh, once the bleeding subsides, um, it's done. Mm -hmm. It's done. Is all that, that time leading up to actual being in menopause called perimenopause? Yes. Okay. That's what we call it before you get to menopause. Menopause is when it's done. Mm -hmm. Perimenopause is when you're going through all the symptoms mm -hmm. of menopause. For those of us who've had all of those symptoms mm -hmm. and some of them <laughs> severe, <laughs> <laughs> what are some of the, um, the reliefs that your favorite recommendations or relief that you've that are the best ones or that you've heard work really well so it depends on how often you're having the symptoms so usually what I would do is ask you about your diet okay because we know uh, if you're a caffeine drinker if you um, eat a lot of uh, sweets and very spicy foods those are triggers for hot flashes Mm -hmm. And so those women will tend to have more problems with hot flashes. Mm -hmm. uh, and usually I will start out with um, encouraging to use something over the counter, a supplement that has no hormones in it. Mm -hmm. And there's one called Estrovin. Um, Estrovin is just a supplement. It has some uh, black cohosh in it. Uh, and it helps to relieve symptoms of um, the hot flashes, the night sweats, uh, irritability. Uh, some women have uh, problems staying asleep the whole night. Mm -hmm. And so that particular supplement comes in three different strengths. It has a regular strength, uh, extra strength, and then a nighttime formula. So you just choose one of the three that you want to try to use. And the key is you have to take it every day like a vitamin. You can't take it just, okay, I'm having a hot flash, so I'm going to take an estrogen. Those supplements you have to take every day to uh, have some relief mm -hmm. from the symptoms. Mm -hmm. uh, there are something called Rimafin um, that can help with hot flashes. Um, some physicians even do um, a bioidentical uh, meds, yeah, yeah. where they do testing to see where you're deficient, but usually the bioidentical testing and that stuff is for once you're truly done with menopause. They don't usually do that before uh, the end of menopause. Mm -hmm. I've had it done and it worked very well for me. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. The, and the pellets. The pellets, I love the pellets. I could not get the facility that I was working at to do the pellets, but mm -hmm. I love the pellets Me because <laughs> they they can go in and look at your level. It's individualized. You know, if I leave, need a little bit more testosterone, I get a little bit extra of that. If I need a little bit extra estrogen, a little bit of testosterone, I get that. And it's just wonderful. I, it's the best it thing. Um, I never had the, uh, the ability to put them in, but... Uh, I worked with a physician in Texas that when they came out, she used to be my, uh, I used to work for her and she was so excited. Oh, I wish you were here because we got this new thing, BioT. And it was like, oh my God, I wish I was there so I could do those, you know. So are but, they um, you're inserted, like in your skin? The yeah, under the skin. Oh. And they dissolve, you know, and, but Kaiser was, is a no for it. So. I have several doctors that I know in the air in here in, in Southern California that do it. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. So if you need to know, I have. I actually I have contact. had a call. The doctors that uh, came up with this bio T actually uh, in Dallas, and I actually called them after I stopped working where I was working and to see if I could train and put them in. But you have to be with a physician. So. Uh, yeah. But it's a good idea. I mean, everyone. I haven't talked to one person 
that tell me they have the bile tea that has been unhappy with it. Is the that medicine, amazing? Is it mm -hmm. covered by insurance or? No. Of course not. No. And it's worth it's, every penny. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing that really works. Mm -hmm. What about um, like creams and things like that? That They do have hormone creams. Now they, these have hormones, uh, just the estrogen, um, the gels that you can put on the skin. Mm -hmm. We also have a, a vaginal uh, hormone, estro, uh, primrin, um mm -hmm cream that you can insert mm -hmm. uh and the the one the cream is usually just for um vaginal dryness mm -hmm. it doesn't help you with um hot flashes right right i use something called the fem ring and the fem ring uh i don't know if you're familiar with the nuva ring which is a birth control ring mm -hmm. well it's kind of on the same order but with the fem ring you insert it and it stays in place for three months and it's a very low dose um, hormone mm -hmm. and it's for hot flashes and vaginal dryness. And it's something that you don't have to think about taking every day. Yeah. So for me, it's the next best thing to the bio tea mm -hmm. um, because it puts the estrogen right where you need it and it works for the hot flashes too. And this is the only one that's vaginal that works for both. And it's a low enough dose that you're not... 0 0.5. Okay. Very low. Yeah. And it lasts for 90 days. Mm -hmm. So you change your ring every 90 days. Doesn't um, interfere with intercourse or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And do you... Does it have to be done by a doctor or, or it's a prescription you get? It's a prescription you, you get and you put it in yourself. Okay. And put a you know, note in your calendar so you know when to change it because you don't feel it's there. Mm-hmm. Once it's in place, um, you don't feel that it's, that it's even there. Yeah, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Think about that. They have pills too. Um, the pills, you have to take your pills you know, every day. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the hormone pills uh, depends on your history of like high blood pressure and uh, your cholesterol levels. So a lot of providers will do your uh, liver profile, you know, um, you know, do all your labs to make sure that you're a good candidate for mm -hmm. being on a hormone. If you had any history of any uh, blood clots in your history, you cannot have any hormones. Mm -hmm. So uh, you would have to stick to more of the supplements that I was talking about earlier. You know, my mom uh, had a total hysterectomy Mm -hmm. after my sister was born and, mm -hmm. and so she was only 34 years old when she when she had this and then was on hormones and I all I know is what she says you know mm -hmm. I don't really know but mm -hmm. she was on hormones forever you know okay. I mean from then on until she you know finally went through menopause and mm -hmm. you know fortunately for her um but you would think that many years of of estrogen regimen that she mm -hmm. might have had some problems, you know, but, but she didn't. And, mm -hmm. um, but man, what a kind of forced into, um, I, I don't know. It just seemed, it, things were so drastic back then, you know, like, did yeah. she really need it? Did she not need it? You know. I actually had a hysterectomy when I was 30 mm. because I had a, um, procedure and the doctor punctured my uterus and so it had to come out. Yeah. So I was on, uh, oral, uh, hormones, for many years and it gave me migraines. Mm -hmm. And um, after I got off of that, that's when they came out with the femoring. Mm -hmm. And I've been on the femoring since then. The guidelines as far as hormones are changing too. Uh, at first, you might have remember back, it's probably been about 20 years ago when they were talking about the estrogen and cancer and the big scare. Right. And um, they were doing the study with the estrogen and the progesterone together. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the study, what they found out was if they, women, we put them on a low dose estrogen only, they did much better. And so that's what most providers will, will do. Uh, and a lot of providers want to take you off the estrogen and, you know, in a short period of time, mm -hmm. I'm 60, going to be 62 this year and I'm still on my ring and I will fight anyone taking me off my ring. <laughs> <laughs> Because what we're finding out is that they're, they're looking more at it as an individual. Yeah, 
yeah. thing. Uh, you do have to have your regular checkups to make sure everything's okay, uh, that you don't have any risk factors. Um, but it's more individual now. And it depends on how um, comfortable your, your provider is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I have, I have a patient that was 70 years old and she was like me. She was like, you're going to have to give my estrogen or it's going to be a problem <laughs> up in here. And so I had to, you know, put her with her primary care doctor, you know, and she was perfect health, you know, and it's a, a year by year trial, you know, yeah. you will give it to you now, but you got to come back and this, you can't leave for five years and get your prescriptions filled. Mm -hmm. So you come every year and it just depends on the provider. But now they're, the guidelines are, you know, some women can stay up, they're saying 65. They've increased it to 65, mm -hmm. um, but not all providers are comfortable with that. You know, so it's just an individual thing. Well, everything is so individual, you know. You're, yeah, and that's how it should be. You know, that's how it should be. Yeah, and, you know, with, um, I met a woman the other day that said, you know, I just, my periods just stopped and that was that. <laughs> and I was like, and really? I felt like something. <laughs> <laughs> you. Some, you know, apparently. Some women don't have it. Some people Their periods don't. stop, no yeah. hot flashes, no nothing. You my know? best friend was like that. She had no symptoms, nothing. Yeah. Where did you bury her body? I know. <laughs> I'll never tell. <laughs> something, something else I want to bring up, too, about the hormones and the genital area, too. Mm -hmm. uh, I was saying that all women have vaginal dryness with um, menopause, but some women actually, if they're not as sexually active, uh, the vaginal tissues do atrophy, you know. Or if you're single and it's and you're in between a long haul of not having intercourse, mm -hmm. vaginal tissues sometimes when they say you, you don't use it, you lose it. Mm -hmm. Some women that's a, a big deal for, not everyone. Uh, but another reason why to have uh, annual well woman exams to see how that tissue is around your genital area. Mm -hmm. um, some women will start to have more problems with incontinence where they're leaking urine more often. Mm -hmm. All that's related to your estrogen. You know, as your estrogen decreases, uh -huh. uh, the estrogen helps to keep those muscles around the urethra tight, right. like when you were younger. Right. And for some I've, women, sorry, mm -hmm. is this I've heard some women um, ha um, have a lot of pain during sex during menopause. Is that yes, because of, like, because of the dryness, the, the dryness, the mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What can they do for that? Uh, hormones, like a. Mm -hmm like a permanent vaginal cream or either the femrin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the femrin, you, you mentioned that, that they're saying now that some people can take hormones up until they're 65 and beyond. What if you, you know, you've already, you've got, gone through menopause and so forth and you still have issues with vaginal dryness. Can you take the femrin? Yeah. Yes. They After have that. 65. Yeah. They have a, um, something called Vagifem too. It's, it's just for vaginal dryness and not hot flashes. Mm -hmm. So they can give you that ring too. But it's in a ring because that, that ring. cream stuff is just, oh, that's yeah. cool. No, the cream is messy. That's a lot of women don't want to do the cream. And the cream, usually you don't, um, usually we tell you to use like a gram, which is like a half of a applicator full, you mm -hmm. know, every three days. Mm -hmm. um, or some women just put it around the, the vaginal opening if they're finding that's the area that they're having a problem, put a small amount there. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're needing the applicator full inside because of you know atrophy inside, then yeah, it can be a little messy. Mm -hmm. And there's another condition uh, called uh, lichen sclerosis that some women who are menopausal get. And with this condition, uh, the actual lips of the vaginal area and the small lips, the labia minora, the smaller lips, actually fuse together and atrophy and actually get small, really small, and the vaginal opening gets small. And so, and it causes a lot of vaginal itching, chronic itching. And uh, some women will think, oh, I have a yeast infection. I'm having, you know, a lot of yeast infections. If you have anyone that has chronic, chronic itching in that area and they're menopausal, they need to get it checked out.
because mm -hmm. that's something that needs to be treated and make sure that it's nothing uh, uh, more as a carcinogen type of thing going on. Mm -hmm. yeah. Boy. It's so many crazy. things that we have to go through. <laughs> And that's, that's fairly rare. You don't see a lot of people with that, but it's very, it's common enough to where I've had several patients that it. have it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, awesome. and the bladder prolapse, that's another thing that some women will get is uh, what we call a cystocele. That's where the bladder just kind of drops down into the vaginal opening. And you feel like I have something in the vagina, you know? Mm -hmm. And when we do a vaginal exam, we can actually see where the bladder has dropped down into the opening and it's just because of the the tissue has you know you've had children you know some people are just more sensitive in that way where the bladder will drop in those areas i had never heard of that and i just um a colleague of mine had surgery for that mm -hmm. um, middle of last year mm -hmm. i'd never heard of that a lift yeah yeah well i mean they the bladder they had, had mm -hmm. dropped into her vagina so mm -hmm. There's several different, you know, some levels is, they call it elective surgery for it because it's not something that's harmful, but um, level ones, you know, don't usually have any type of surgeries for it. They have something called a pessary that they can un insert to hold the bladder up. Mm -hmm. And some women who are at high risk to have surgeries, uh, they'll use a pessary and it just looks like a ring. They have different shaped rings to hold them, hold it up. Mm -hmm. And um, they'll do that, you know. Some yeah. women will have the surgery because they don't want to deal with the ring, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. And um, but again, it's an, another reason to have an exam. And also the the rectum, they have something called a rectus seal that can drop where your your rectum folds into the vagina too. And so um, they used to call that a A and P repair. You might have heard that back in the day, where they just lift everything up inside you know, and put it back to the ligaments. <laughs> Everything drops after menopause. <laughs> do men have this? What, what do men have that drops? You know, what do they have that drops? <laughs> Gravity, damn it. <laughs> oh, the joy. Um, yeah. yeah. So, Wow. Yeah, just the main thing is that if you notice anything different, go into yeah. your provider. You know, don't sit at home and say, oh, well, you know, it's probably nothing or think of your own idea of what it could be. Always go get get it checked out. Yeah. yeah. Get it checked and out. As, as women in business, busy women, what are your recommendations to to really, I don't know, I guess stress levels that all plays into everything as well. So are there any suggestions that you have for us women who are very, very busy, business owners? What can we do for ourselves? I do. As a, a fairly new, I feel if, unless I'm here for 10 years, I still think I'm very new to being an entrepreneur. Um, having some time in the morning for yourself. You have to have cut out time, just like we have all these appointments and calendars or things that we have to do during the day. Uh, you have to block time for yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, and preferably, it's the first thing in the morning, if you can. Uh, just And it doesn't have to be a whole hour, just 15 minutes. Just take 10, 15 minutes, be in a space by yourself, meditate, uh, do some journaling. Um, if you can do some uh, stretching exercises, just, you know, a couple of yoga moves, just have that time just for yourself. Because um, I've learned that once I start working on this computer, I had to get on the schedule. I was on here last night till 11. So mm -hmm. I, I broke my own rule yesterday. <laughs> but you have to have breaks in your day uh, to where and actually get up for the breaks, you mm -hmm. know, so um, I broke that rule last night, but I have learned Usually I have a, a you know, my calendar I have into my calendar get up and break and my husband He's on it now. He has noticed that 
what did you eat today? You know, did you get up to eat? You know, I went to the bathroom and I drank some tea, you know, it was like, well, what did you eat? You know, so you have to make time to, for yourself. And then in the evening, you have to have time where you um, unwind. Mm -hmm. You have to get off the computer. When they say get off the, the cell phones and the phone, because every time I hear a buzz on the phone, I'm wanting to look at it. So now I have to mute my phone. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and my family knows if it's something emergency to call the house phone. Mm -hmm. But you have to have time for yourself. You have to have regular time um, to get away, you know, whether, whether it's getting away, get away, or uh, taking a walk on the beach. My thing is walking on the beach. You know, I, I, I had a walking meeting. I said I was going to bring that up at the luncheon. I did a walking mm -hmm. meeting uh, for the first time. Uh, this week, I was meeting with a, a potential JV partner, and she came out. She wanted to come to Long Beach because she hadn't been here in a while, and so we had breakfast. And she, I said, well, what are you going to do now? She said, I'm going to, uh, I haven't been here so long. I want to walk on this new walking path. I said, oh, I'll walk with you. We walked five miles. <laughs> and I didn't even know. I knew because that's my walking path, so I knew we had walked five miles. I didn't know if she knew we walked five. Yeah. But um, we were that's talking. Like <laughs> yeah, just and just we were walking, you know, and I had burned calories, I felt good, the sun was out, and I was ready to come back and, and work. And I was more clear, more focused. And um when we don't do that, uh we get fatigued. Yeah. We have problems sleeping at night and staying asleep. Um yeah. your stress level is high. You know, this um this past holiday season, um for the first time since I became an entrepreneur, um, I blocked out a lot of time for myself because I know it's it's a stressful time and it's an emotional time and so forth. And I was so glad that I did. And I, and I really, I didn't violate it. I It was like, these are, I've blocked this time out. I did it before Thanksgiving and I did it before and after Christmas. And it was just the best thing ever. I If I wanted to do some work, I did. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't, I didn't take any meetings. I didn't, you know, schedule phone calls. I didn't, I didn't do any of that. And it was really, really good. It was super good for me. And I was, but it was, you know, like the first time that I, that I did that, you know, cause, and I would feel myself saying, well, I can, I can slide that in. That's okay. I, that's all right. I'll do that. And it was like, nope, you mm -hmm. just, you have to be strict with yourself. Mm -hmm. I did that for the first time um, with no electronics on when I went to St. Vincent for my uh, great niece's pinning ceremony. Mm -hmm. And the a Airbnb I was at didn't have any TV. And the first thing I'm like, no TV. And I don't even watch the TV. But it's just the idea that no TV was there for noise because I have the TV on for mm -hmm. noise. Because my husband said, are you watching this? No, it's just on for noise. Mm -hmm. I had no TV. I had my cell phone, of course, but I wasn't calling anybody because I was in a different country. Mm -hmm. And I was among fruit trees and hammocks and the ocean right outside. I had the most relaxing time I ever had, and it was wonderful. And the week before had been horrible, you know. And so I came back with a whole new attitude, and it's like, okay, that's what I need to do too. I need to make sure that I do keep those times where I'm not using. Uh, electronics, not keeping my eye on the phone because I might have a contact, you know, coming. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to have time for ourselves yeah. because I get irritable, you know, I get irritable, uh, I get teary, you know, emotional, you know, watching ET, you want to cry at the end, you know? <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, what's up with that? I've seen ET like how many times? <laughs> All the Christmas movies. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, so it's like, okay, what's up with that, you know, so we have to uh, have time to uh, de-stress, mm -hmm. to be productive. Well, we are whole people, you know, so I, I liked how you said everybody's hormonal issues and stuff are, are unique to them and have to be treated uniquely to them. It's, we are a whole person, so our yes. emotional health ties into it just as well. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And I don't believe those type A people that say, oh, I, I just go, 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 and I, I don't need much sleep, and I don't, yeah, well, 
you may they may go a long time but they will at some point crash and burn yeah mm -hmm. yeah and they may not notice it but people around them will notice yeah that they need to yeah. rest in all different ways yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Cheryl, this has been um, this has been part enlightening and part depressing. <laughs> oh gosh! <laughs> but the more that we know about ourselves, the, the better off that we are. You know, yes. and, and I like to say that education sometimes removes the um, the mystery. You know, which yes. removes the fear. You know, exactly. So, I think this has been super profitable, a good use of my time, and I'm sure it's a, a good use of everyone that will tune in and listen later. How can oh, people yeah. reach you, Cheryl, if they wanna uh, talk to you about this more or maybe take advantage of some of your services? Okay, they can uh, email me at Cheryl at safedatingover50.com. That's my email for there. Or they can call me, 409-553-2161. I'm always open to talk about any women's health issues. That's great. Great. Well, thank you so much for being our guest uh, today. Oh, thank you. And I want to thank um, everybody who tuned in, as well as those that will be listening to this in the future. And stay tuned. It's a new year. We've got all kinds of really good stuff coming up um, in the ladies' room and on Ask Me Anything. There's just lots of... Uh, of juicy informational stuff that we're going to be learning in 2020. So uh, watch the Facebook group, watch the Facebook page, watch LinkedIn. You'll be seeing lots of advertising about it mm -hmm. and uh, looking forward to the next one. Thanks again, Cheryl, so very much. Thank you. Thank bye you, bye. Cheryl. Thank you. Bye. Bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.